All right, well, here we go. China, period one through period six. So period one is from 10,000 BC to about 600. China is powerful because it is an ancient river valley civilization. It's one of the first four river valleys. So as such, China is one of those things that's going to take us from the very beginning of history all the way to the very end, whether we talk about Tiananmen Square or not. And as China settles in the Wang Ho or Yellow River Valley, the first emperor, you guys may remember, is Emperor you. Yu. Who? Uh, you. Me. No. You. you. And you is blessed by the Chinese gods to be the very first emperor. And he shows three common Chinese traits of his family, hard work, and devotion to duty. He took care of his family, he worked hard, and he did his job. Those are three things that are going to permeate throughout Chinese history. It's one of the reasons why for the majority of Chinese history, the Chinese do not like merchants. Because merchants were seen as people who make money off of everybody else's labor. Everyone else works hard, and then that guy just sells the stuff. So, Shang Dynasty and the Yellow River, it's also known as the River of Sorrows, because no matter what, the Chinese have a very difficult time controlling the flood. The, the mud, the bricks, their dams and dikes just don't work, so it destroys everything that goes on. And so if you guys need me to, after we do the bare bones like this, I can go to PowerPoints that actually have little like, pictures. But I already did that review way back when. So anyway. Now, one of the things that the Shang Dynasty does is when they control the river, you digs those irrigation canals, they build, use their agricultural surplus. All of a sudden, when they begin to civilize, they have more food than they can eat. And this causes a population boom, and they are going to begin a civilization that will be based on trade. They will trade goods in and around their immediate area. The number one thing the Chinese are going to trade over time is silk. And it will create the greatest and most famous trade route of all time, known as the Silk Road. All right, the Shang become militarily powerful. But early on, the Chinese believed um, that they, they called themselves the Middle Kingdom because due to their geographic location way over in East Asia, they felt that they were the only people in the world. Egypt was way over. So was Mesopotamia. So was India. So the Chinese felt that they were the only ones there. It made them very ethnocentric. Now, <clears throat> how can you remember the, the early part of Chinese history? Just remember your Mulan. All right, Mulan's boyfriend is Shang. All right. Um, Mushu wakes up the ancestors. We're going to talk about ancestor worship in one second. The emperor calls China the Middle Kingdom, and we meet the Chinese traditional enemy, the Xiongnu, or the Mongols, which means angry slave. And the Chinese, just like everybody else, it's so weird not having anybody over here. Got, you want me to no, 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 it's okay, but I keep looking and there's like nobody there. The Chinese believed in the polytheistic gods of nature, all right? The god of the wind, the god of the sun, the god of, of, of the rain. But they added a little something extra special to that. And that is the practice of ancestor worship, where they felt that if they prayed to their ancestors, their ancestors were closer to the Lord of heaven. 
Kind of like Catholics use saints, all right? You can't pray for yourself 24 hours a day, but a saint can. But you couldn't ask for anything greedy. Can you please protect the family? Can you help the harvest to grow? Can you make sure the idiot Zhang Nu don't invade? It had to be non-greedy help. No other ancient civilization has this practice. Things that are invented in the Shang Dynasty, bits of technology, is the wheel. A single axle wheel barrel where you, you know, pick up two handles and move some heavy equipment. Silk, as we know, is the big trade export. And then bronze metalwork. They don't have really strong iron. All they have is bronze. Yes, ma'am? I know the wheel wasn't invented in um, the Americas because they didn't have like, domesticated animals. But why did they have, would you, did you say that they had a wheelbarrow? Wheelbarrow, yes. Animals that they could use to recruit? They, they could. They could. And they attached it to like a wagon um, eventually because the wagon, it becomes that chariot. But it comes out of um, China. China, it will be forever a patriarchal society. The focus is on the family, the extended family. Mom, dad, kids, grandma, grandpa, and the cousins. Family connection is very, very um, important. So that is the early formative part of China. It is a turning point in the world, again, because the Shang Dynasty <coughs> is the first of 31 Chinese dynasties. And the Chinese believe in a thing known as the dynastic cycle, where I've talked about the six steps. The beginning, there is a guy who is unafraid to roll up his sleeves and go on and do the hardcore dirty work. He's not afraid to get out there with the people and work like you. you right? And his son and his grandson, maybe a couple on down the line, will do the same thing. But eventually, you get to step two, which is the aging dynasty, where now the emperor doesn't really have to do anything. Right? All the hard work has been done. All I have to do is just, Make sure that just walk around and maintain it, keep, keep an eye on it. And eventually, the aging dynasty will bottom out at stage three, which is where you get an emperor who's greedy, he's evil, and corrupt. He is the complete opposite of his ancient ancestor. The defensive walls fall apart. The government is full of corrupt officials. Irrigation canals break down. There's bandits in the provinces. There may be an invasion. And the emperor doesn't care because he's up in the palace living, living the high life. The gods are going to get so angry. We blessed you with the mantle of leadership. Now, you scumbag, we're going to take it. We're going to take it away from you. All right? And see how you do. And so that will bring in step four, which will be a period of, like, chaos. You know, um, we have the aging dynasty, the gods remove the mantle. So now there's going to be flood, there's going to be famine, there's going to be invasion, there's going to be disease, there's going to be chaos, because the people need to be taught a lesson. And out of that chaos, someone is going to emerge, usually a general or a peasant. Someone of the people who knows what the people want, what the people need, and they will come to power, and they will kick off the whole process all over again. So we get to around 1027 BC, the Shang are going to become corrupt. Yes, sir? So with this dynastic cycle, did, were the Chinese people aware of the fact that this cycle was taking place? So was it like a... Looking back on it, we can see, oh, there are those There it is. Steps. And the reason why you're punished is because you should have seen the signs and you should know better. So the gods have got to punish you because you, Taylor, you saw the signs. It's not a mystery. Confucius told you what was going to happen, but you didn't. Which is why when we get the Confucian scholars, like the Han and the Ming dynasties last for so long because they make sure that they hold it off as long as possible. All right, you guys with me? All right. All right. Second dynasty is the Zhao or the Chao dynasty. 
They last for about 800 years from 1027 to 256 um, BC. So they are going to be a bridge between periods one and period two, if you look at those AP periods. I don't really like them, but it is what it is. We're going to go from period one into period two. And the Zhao take over from the Shang. They were warriors. Here's where we get a little bit of synthesis. The Zhao were the warrior wing, the warrior extension of the Shang dynasty. Just like the Aztecs were for the Toltecs, and exactly like the Seljuks were for the Mamluks, who would become the Ottoman Turks. Same thing, the warrior wing says, wait a minute, why are we doing all the hard work? Why don't we just, why don't we just take over? I mean, just, you know, shoot, well, we can run this better than you can. And military people, whether you're Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great, or Otto von Bismarck, or Suleiman the Magnificent, they like order, chain of command, general, colonel, major, captain, lieutenant. Right? They like that structure. They like that um, organization. And it is the Zhao who claims the right of the mandate of, of, of heaven. The Shang have become so corrupt, we have got to take over. The gods no longer want the Shang to rule, so we are going to take over. Now, if it's not broke, don't fix it. So they keep the things that the Shang were doing that work. They maintain all of their traditions. There's just simply a new political leader. But the Zhao will be the first in history to develop what we are going to call traditional feudalism. Are you guys hot? Like, I feel like insanely hot. Right? I mean, I, I know I look good, but I'm like, really okay. I'm going to open a couple windows. All right, I don't even know. Um, the Zhao become the first. They want to control their territory. But the king knows that he can't be everywhere. And one of the things that made the Shang king, the Shang emperor, different from many emperors throughout all of world history is that he didn't build one specific palace. He built a bunch of tiny ones all over the empire. So he was constantly traveling. He might give his cousin his nephew and his brother a palace to live in and control for him. But when the emperor showed up, it was his, it was his house. So he got the master bedroom. Well, now the empire is so big, we really don't have time to do all of that. So what he does is he begins to give away land, doesn't have hard cash money. Taxes at this time are paid in labor, and they're paid in like food, wheat, rice, fish. Like how that worked, I don't know. Hopefully they put some rice and fish in a Tupperware and sent it to the emperor. I don't know how all that works, but whatever. All right. uh, the emperor can't move around anymore. So I will give you land and a place to live, but you control it for me. Who does it really belong to? It belongs to me. And as long as you collect taxes, keep things working, and enforce justice, you get a nice job. But you screw up, then I'll, I'll just get rid of you. This is feudalism in medieval Europe. It's feudalism in China. It's feudalism in, no, it is China, in Japan. It's feudalism in Mother Russia. Raquel, question, ma'am? I, sure? I was wondering, because usually when I learn about feudalism, it's because the king does not have enough money to pay, so they pay with land instead of same case, because we don't really have money yet. Like we're still like trading and bartering and, and doing all that. So um, now, because of this, there is an enormous gap in Chinese society. The gap between the rich and the poor is bigger in ancient China than it is anywhere else. 
This is when the king and the nobles were living in fancy houses or palaces, and the people were living in mud holes in the ground covered with bamboo roofs. Like, really, I'm living in a muddy hole and you're living in a palace? That kind of, that kind of sucks. All right? That's not any good. So, at this time, by the end of the Zhao Chao dynasty, what else do we have going on in the world? Well, all right, we've got the Greek Empire that is going. The Persian Empire is strong in Asia. In India, we have the Mayura dynasty, and Rome is going to be gaining in strength. So you see, all of those civilizations in other parts of the world are rising and falling. Where in China? China is just... We're just being China, man. We're just moving right along. Everything else will rise and fall, collapse, be conquered. And China is just, we're only on our second of 31 dynasties. What are you against? All right. All right. So, all right. Now, after this, we get the great warring states era. After the Zhao Chao collapse, there's chaos. Things are out of control. And this is that weird part in world history where we're going to begin to factor in philosophy and religion. Judaism, all right, Hinduism, Buddhism, Laoism, Taoism, Confucianism, because we've advanced as far as we possibly can. And now we've got to find a way to get order in here. We've got to find a way to make that next step in civilization. So China breaks up into different warring factions. There's not one strong dominant government that's able to stabilize the area. So it's going to be chaotic for a period of time. And in all that chaos and all that mess, we get guys, what type of guys like strict order and efficiency? Military guys. This brings us to the Qin Dynasty. And remember, it's when we take it on the Qin. Kapow. Alright? We're going to hit you hard. It's a very short-lived dynasty. It is the smallest of the Chinese dynasties. It's the C-H-I-N or the Q-I-N dynasty. Same thing. 220 to 226 B.C. So, we have the great legalist emperor, Shi Huangdi. Shi Huangdi is one of the extreme, big-time, famous Chinese emperors. And legalism, Mia? 220 to 206? Yes. Okay. Yes. It doesn't last very long because people get like, man, you know, this was cool for a bit, but man, this sucks. It was kind of like being in England under Oliver Cromwell. Well, the war is over, but this, man, this boy, we can't dance, we can't sing, we can't like go to a pub, we can't play Quidditch, we can't play cricket. Quidditch is a thing, they play on college campuses. I don't even really know. So anyway, so all right. Shi Wang Di is this legalist minister, and he believes his advisors that all people are greedy, all people are bad, all humans by nature are. Selfish scumbags. Yes, ma'am. What was the philosopher that also said that? Lao Zi. L A O. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're going to drop the hammer. If you're greedy and you're selfish, what we're going to do is we're going to give you swift, harsh punishments. If what you do incorrect is quickly and swiftly and brutally punished, you won't. Do it anymore. And if you do something really well, then we will reward you for it. I am the legalist minister. I swiftly and harshly punish you. And Miss Rajan is the good minister. You guys do good, and Miss Rajan gives you guys candy. candy. All right, so I'm Shi Wang Di, and she is a Confucian scholar, and it kind of works for here at Chapel Hill High School. I hope she doesn't mind that reference. That is a compliment to her. Okay, okay. All right, there you go. All right. Harsh laws and strict discipline. 
If I let you guys decide what you're going to do, you're clearly going to screw it up. You're going to cheat. You're going to lie. You're going to steal. So I'm going to tell you what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. There's no discussion. There's no debate. There's no misinterpretation. This is what we are going to do. And what he does is re-centralize the government. So what is centralizing the government? What does that mean? And who is Marissa? Everything is unified. And who's the central authority? The king. All right. I am in charge. There's no discussion. There's no debate. All right. There's no... You know, this is not, there's no question how it's going to be. I am in charge. And he makes everything uniform. And when you hear that term uniform, what does that mean? Like, what is a sports uniform or a band uniform? Everything looks the same. Right? So there's no deviation. So everything is going to be uniform. All right? The laws are all going to be equal. All right? We're going to get a currency, and we're all going to use that money. The laws are going to apply to everyone. Prices, weights and measures that you buy and sell goods with, prices are going to be fixed. Standard weights and measures. A loaf of bread costs a dollar. Not two dollars, not a dollar thirty-three, but a dollar. So that's that. And here is the thing... Um, Marissa mentioned, mentioned unification. In China, there's a bunch of different dialects. The two most famous are Cantonese and Mandarin. Well, Shi Wangdi says, look, we can speak different dialects, but we are all going to write the same. And the Chinese back in the Shang Dynasty are going to come up with written characters. And it was a very difficult language to learn how to write. There was over 10,000 different characters. And remember, changing the angle in, a, in its most simplistic explanation could turn a compliment into an insult or a positive into a negative. So it had, you had to write very neatly and brilliantly, like we see with malligraphy, all right? my own you know, calligraphic you know, sect. And so if you, got, you were a, a, a poor peasant boy, your family would throw you into school because if you learned how to write and got a job, it was the only way for the family to move out of poverty. So he standardizes the written language. He is the guy that takes the separate pieces of the Great Wall of China and combines them into one. Also, to showcase his power, he builds the famous terracotta warriors to be his army in the afterlife as well. Problem is, Shi Wangdi came in and he changed too quickly. Everything he did was in warp speed, and people need time to get accustomed to the change. It's like when some of you get into a pool and you go down the steps into the shallow end and you kind of like walk in um, trying to get acclimated to the temperature. We call that the Alexander Great, Alexander Knight's technique, right? Wait a minute, you're a diver. That's the Marissa Tachi technique. Tachi touches her way into the pool and then she swims for like three miles. Alexander Knight, he says, what? I'm just going to... Jump in and do it quickly. Alexander may not check if there's water in the pool. It could be ice water. It could be boiling water. But Alexander's going in. That's Shi Wang Di. All right, he's going hard. He's going all in. And people never know from day to day what is right and what is what is wrong. And I, I'm afraid to do that because if I do it wrong, I'm going to get I'm going to get in trouble. So I'm just not going to do it. And so the people, you can only oppress and beat down people for so long, and they rebel. So the Qin Dynasty is over very quickly.
But it's during this time that Confucius' writings begin to really catch on. Now, he was a philosopher who, much like his contemporary Socrates, said that they didn't really invent anything. They're just teachers. Is that Moana? Yeah. What's that Star Spangled Banner? I mean, they're singing. I don't know. What is it? Someone's got some power in their clutch. That's all I know. I've not seen the Moana yet, so. Whoa. Whoa. Whoa, you like Taylor right now. I can do the lawn. Let's get down to business. To the feet. At least you've seen the test. Did they send me? We got to record that freshman when I asked for upperclassmen. You were the saddest bunch I have ever met, but you can bet before. I'll make an AP student. Are you getting all this, Alexander, or are you just here because you're going to make No, I'm, I'm here because I want to come and I'm getting You're logging this in. Does this all sound familiar? Yeah. yeah. You guys feel okay that, oh my God, I actually no, like know stuff? All right, there we go. All right. If you gotta go for a walk, man, get some air, go for a walk, it's all good. Yeah, you like run or something, you get blood flowing. Go take a lap around the school, dude. Down the hallway. I'm good. I'm like a stack. I just like a steam engine. I just keep going. I get tired. Leave the door open to get us some air. Okay. Alright. This will bring us to one of the great dynasties in Chinese history, the great Han Dynasty. And the Han will be the bridge between B.C. and A.D., if you're old school with me, or B.C.E. and C.E. We've got the long-lived Han Dynasty. Very great synthesis comparison. It was a, an essay several years ago, like 2007, 2008. We beat this like a drum or a pinata at a five-year-old birthday. The Han Dynasty is easily compared to ancient Rome, all right? It, it, they're near the same time, high levels of unification, high levels of trade and technology. The Han Dynasty is awesome. And it starts when they have their great emperor, Han Wu Ti. And he's a warrior emperor, and much like Rome, he goes, you know what? In order to be a good emperor, I got to expands. He begins to expand and conquer territory. He sets the standard. From this point onward, strong Chinese dynasties are measured by how much they enlarge their empires. If you're a powerful emperor, China gets bigger. He's the guy who pushes westward expansion. The Chinese know other people are there. But the Han Dynasty is safe. So you can travel from what is today Korea, and you could travel westward down into India and over in Mesopotamia. The Silk Road trade route is bringing not only trade and gold and salt and silk and curry and garlic and you know cinnamon, but it's also bringing technology, the wheel. The idea of Buddhism. Those ideas are being intermixed around Africa, Europe, and Asia. Because in the Han Dynasty, the Silk Road will make it as far as Rome. And it's here in the Han Dynasty that they take what Confucius wrote and they say, you know what, this makes perfect sense. And Confucius came up with the idea of filial piety, the five key relationships. Ruler to subject, father to son, older brother to younger brother, husband to wife, and friend to friend. Everybody in that chain, except the emperor, has a dual responsibility. As a superior, your job is to teach and help someone below you. But as the inferior, you're the younger brother to the older brother. You have to listen and learn to what they teach you. And Confucius says, we want to stop the bad stuff from happening 
Everybody just do your job, all right? When I used to yell to my son's basketball team this winter, all right? Less NBA and more UVA, all right? The University of Virginia, what makes them special is you get five or six guys who play as a team. There's really no superstar. They just kind of chug along and do their thing, all right? Everybody plays their role. If everybody does their job, then there's going to be no, there's going to be no problems, right? I'm going to say this on air. If some of your middle school teachers would have done their job, you guys would have a, you'd have a clue. Like, what? First Revolution? We watched Les Mis. Right. I have this remark. 24601. All right, so. All right. Incorrect facts we learned. Uh, it's the prison number of the main character, Jean Valjean. It was two four six zero four. I'm culturing you guys up today. I've got some Hamilton. Last year, New York. Yeah, yeah. Man, you saw the Broadway. I saw. Well, I know all the lyrics. I don't. <laughs> Give me a quick twenty second timeout. YouTube land. Deal with it. Take a drink of water. <laughs> There'll be kids in Peru give me likes on this. You watch. I'm serious. Like, well, thank you, man. I know it was garbage. If any of you were taught by Bob Nolman in Cincinnati, now you're getting the real facts. How about that? It's, a, it's my reading part from Bob. Bob's all right. Here. So anyway, all right. Uh, where were we? Um, here's where we buy into Confucius's um, ideals, where the Han Dynasty will create the Confucian civil service exam. In order to get people to run a good government that we can be reliable and be dependent on, teach them what Confucius said. Remember, Confucius isn't an innovator, he's a transmitter of tradition. What does China do well? I'm just telling you what we do. And remember, why did Confucius get fired all those times when he was a political advisor? He was honest. Told the truth. Leaders don't like to hear that, but what is our Malaga Confucian saying? Do the right, right, thing, right. not the popular thing. All right, there we go. So, all right. Civil service exam. You get tested. <coughs> All right. Yes, sir. Piece of synthesis, possibly the uh, the Swedish college system. Yes, for um, Confucius, where you're not afraid to speak your mind, and you're also trained and evaluated on a small village, then a mid-sized city, then a large empire. Sort of, not kind of a stretch, but not really. Is the Ottoman series of training up the brothers before they go. Hunger Games on, on, on each other, all right? We'll teach you how to administrate before there's the free-for-all. Taylor and then Marissa. It was Louis XIV who used the college system. Peter the Great. Peter the Great. Peter the Great. Yes, ma'am. Like, literally, Socrates would be another, because he was more about, like, questioning people. Exactly. Confucius and Socrates are the great contemporaries. Get at the heart. Do what's right. And Socrates is a great synthesis comparison because he could have chosen the easy way out. He, but he said, no, 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 don't quote the law to me. I wrote the law. So he was doing what Confucius, he was being honest. This is how it is. I'm not going to lie. If you're going to kill me, well, then just do it. Then just do it. I ain't quit playing around. Let's go. Not only did you need a good grade on the Confucian civil service exam, but you also needed a recommendation. Nabil gets an excellent grade on the civil service exam. That doesn't guarantee him a job. But if I'm already a civil servant and I sign on to Nabil, he's good. Here's the catch. If Nabil screws up or Nabil is corrupt, not only does he lose his job, but I lose mine. And this prevented what we like to call the good old boy network. You're not going to give your buddy's son a job because he's your buddy's son. You're going to pick people who can actually do the, job. the work. Mr. Risberger, sir. 
I'm going to come in and pretend I'm not here. Right. Plant trees in Brazil. Um, <laughs> don't use air conditioning. It's a garbage market. It was brilliant. I've been saying it for decades, man. Thank God you finally come around. Dumbest idea I've ever heard. That should be working, Mr. No, Methane. That's a great idea. It's a brilliant idea. He's just mad he never thought of it. Yeah, no, it's a he fantastic. Shoot it into the sun. It's, what's it called? It's called space. Atmosphere. Why? Because it. there's a lot of it. <laughs> All right. Yes. It's uh, kind of like your brain. There's a lot of space. <laughs> It is at this time that Buddhism spreads from India into China. Right? Everybody thinks that Buddhism is a Chinese religion or philosophy. It begins in India and is transmitted via the so pro Taylor and then Mr. Risper. So how did that interfere with like the ancestor worship and well, that is the great thing about Buddhism. Buddhism is one of the world's great religions by means of practitioners because it has the ability to adapt and like more. So we really like that ancestor worship, right? We really like Confucianism. It's kind of what the Buddha says. It's the Eightfold Path. Here are the things that you uh, do. All right, Risperger's communicating with Raquel, probably telling me I'm number one. But that's okay. All right, yes, but not with those digits. Um, it's okay. All right? It really ties into what we're doing. So that's great. Ancestor worship, respect for the old Confucianism, great. You know, that's what Buddha was trying to get us to do, man. That's awesome. You're brilliant. So... Here's the thing where it starts. You guys mentioned the salt and the iron debates. One of the things that makes the Han Dynasty so cool is they virtually did everything that the Qin Dynasty did. They just made it look and sound different. And they took their time. They didn't go at it full speed ahead. And one of the things that the Han did is they never did anything Unless they already had the money for it, the money up front. One of the ways they got that money is they had monopolies on things that everybody wanted or needed. Right? What you guys have, um, it was copper, it was salt, it was iron, and it was alcohol. If you need that stuff, you have to pay us. And it starts the great salt and iron debates where Confucian scholars said, wait a minute, the government should not control these things. And a few legalist ministers left said, well, yeah, the emperor has the right to do all of those things because he's the emperor. He's the emperor. And the Confucian scholar said, nuh-uh, because if the emperor does that, he's nothing better than a merchant. And man... In ancient China, those are, those are those are fighting words. Call me a merchant. I'll whip your tail right here, scumbag. Like, oh, man, God, that's actually... God, what are you going to do now? And so the Confucians claimed victory, but yeah. it didn't really change. So anyway. The other thing that they do at this time is called the ever-level granaries. Where the Hans said, let's take our surplus food and put it in airtight silos. Now, you guys don't know what a silo is. You think it's a neighborhood decoration in Lake Hogan Farms. Well, that used to be a place where in real farms you would store like corn or grain to keep it dry until you needed to use it. You put a wax seal on it. And if there's a famine or a flood, we can get that extra food and we can feed our people and you rotate it every so often so it's easily um, um, replenished. When you have stable dynasties like this one, you have when there's peace, when there's prosperity, there's time for cultural and technological achievement. So a lot of scientific advancements are made during the Han Dynasty. Paper, rice paper will be used to write on. 
That way, if you screw up, you're not chiseling into like a, a, a stone tablet, especially if it's calligraphy. Raquel, your hand okay? Just yes, shake it out, man. All right, you're good. Yes. All right. Um, sundials to be able to record time. My favorite is the seismograph. It was that big weevil wobble that had the different um, marble balls in the dragon's mouth. If a big shock was coming, the big um, you know, clay ball would, would fall out. It wouldn't give you a lot of warning time, but at least it was something. The calendar, 365 and one half day calendar of just about 30 days, very similar um, to, to ours. And in the middle, when things began to like go wrong, the, the, the Chinese said, you know what? Instead of the government controlling the economy, there's no incentive. Now you, seven, nine, 11, 13, 14 guys are here, maybe 15, I'm not really good with math. You're here because your incentive is to do well on the exam. I got 70 AP World students, how many of them are here? Now, some are at track, some are in lacrosse and soccer, and some have jobs, and some just can't make it. But your incentive is to actually do well. So the Chinese government says, look, our people are only going to work so hard because there's no incentive for them to bust their butt. They can work as hard as they want. If they don't get anything extra, then why? I'll just do what I'm, what I'm told. But if you say, hey, the harder you work, the more you're going to benefit, or you can keep the surplus, people are really going to go at it. So let's take the hands-off, laissez-faire um, economy. And things were going really bad, and the dynastic cycle kind of hits bottom. And a guy jumps in, and he tries to help out. And he's very well intentioned, right? It's like Charlie Brown. But everything he does this doesn't. Lucy pulls the football from him. He gets another rock trying to find the great pumpkin, da 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 da. And everything that can possibly go wrong, the Mongols invade, there's a flood, there's famine, and the people say, My God, you know what we gotta do? Rebel. We gotta rebel. Whose fault is this? Wang Mang. Wang Mang. Everybody have fun tonight. What are we going to do to Wang Mang? Yeah. Everybody eat Wang Mang tonight. We break into the palace and we chop up Wang Mang and we eat him. We get through his tail up right there like a guy con key. Oh, wow. All right. All right. So, a distant cousin of the Han show back up and they rejuvenate the empire on up into the 200s. So as Rome um, reaches the end of Pax Romana and begins to decline, so do the Han. And the Han actually play a role in the destruction of Rome because in the middle of the second half of the Han Dynasty, they go and attack the Mongols north of China. And it's a war of extermination. They go so hard at the Mongols the Mongols turn north and they spread westward across the plains of Asia and Europe. And they drive ahead of them like a snowplow all of these other barbarian groups. The Mongols push the Huns of Attila, who push the Ostrogoths, who push the Visigoths, who push the Vandals into Rome. And these barbarians trying to get away from the crazy Mongols, they cross the Danube River and they land on a nice hard surface thing known as a road. And they go, hey Hans, yeah Franz, where does this go? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. It's good, let's go. And they start following the roads right to Rome. Right to Rome. So eventually the great Han dynasty will collapse in 220 AD. Everybody holding steady. All right, I got 14 slides. I don't know how many are left. You guys, we got a couple small ones. In between this, we get the three dynasties, the Sui, the Tang, and the Song. All right, and we've now solidly moved into periods two and three here in Chinese history. 
in the sway are just kind of happy. They quickly stop the chaos that happened after the fall of the Han Dynasty. And their big contribution is they build what's known as the Grand Canal linking the two major rivers, the Yellow River and the Yangtze River. It's the longest canal dug by pure man-made labor. It's about 120 miles long. And what this does is link the northern and southern parts of China and links their economy. This is when I told you, gave you the example of now you could get maple syrup from Vermont down in Georgia to put it on Georgia peaches. I don't know if maple syrup on peaches would taste good, but it, I don't see why, why, it, why it would. Before, Vermont and, and Georgia were too far apart. Now we can zip our produce up and down before it goes back. But the Sway Emperor, after he does all of this, his people are busting their butt. And they're dirt dog poor. And the Sway Emperor, just to be a doofus, really gets in like his barge and sails around. And on his barge, he has just an obscene amount of food and luxury goods. And his people are wearing like raggedy loincloths along the grain canal. They're like, what the heck is he doing? Man, that, that, that dude sucks. So they um, uh, rebel. The emperor is assassinated. And the end of the Sui Dynasty is one of the more violent in Chinese history. When people are starving and they see you living well, it's like, here's your this French revolutionist. French revolutionist. I don't know if that's a word, but it is now in YouTube land. And there is a little bit of synthesis. If you have nothing else, go with this. Remember, China is going to be awesome because, it, again, it runs throughout all of history. And this brings in two more of the big hallmark dynasties. We got the Han, we got the Tang and the Song, and we have the Ming, our big giant um, dynasties. The Tang built on the old Han idea of expansion. A good dynasty expands the empire. Do you guys need a break? Are you guys okay? I just keep going. All right. We got this. We have the Ming. We've got the Yuan, and we've got the Qing Dynasty. And then we can do modern. You guys good about another 15, 20 minutes? All right. If you got to go, you have to go. The Tang will go all the way south, um, all the way down into Tibet, up into Mon Mongolia, over into um, Korea. But they expand too far too fast. It's almost too much territory to govern. Do you remember the old um, uh, God, proximity to authority example I give you? Rachel will misbehave, or Raquel will misbehave until I come back there. When I get back here to Raquel, all of a sudden, she'll be very nice, neat, and tidy. But when I get over to Raquel, what is Nabil doing? True enough. Now I come over to Nabil, and as soon as I get past Christina Alexander, what does James start doing? True and off. All right. The emperor simply can't be everywhere, and so throughout the Tang Dynasty, on the edges, warlords slowly begin to gain in power. They're either friends with the emperor, or they figure, man, it's Rena. She's so far away. 